Before doing any conservation work, you already always need to know what you are trying to preserve, how many they are, where they are, and because without that baseline data, you're not going to be able to make effective and practical conservation policies. So, but, and then also if you have this baseline data, it's also a good measure of how far you've come and if what you're doing is working or not. But to collect this baseline data in Nepal is not very easy because first of all, your topography is not very um, easy to navigate. You have the plains and then you have really steep hills. You have the high mountain plateaus with very thick vegetation, which is a problem if your animals are very elusive in nature. As um, my friend had to go for weeks and weeks before he could take that one picture of that musk deer. So you have elusive animals, very unforgiving terrain, and on top of that you have weather conditions that aren't always favorable. There's a very small window of opportunity when it's not too hot in the Tarai, or the monsoon hasn't set in, or when there's like when it's not snowing in the mountains. So in Nepal it is difficult to do field work. Also, it takes weeks and months to track your animal down. And tracking your animal is very distressing to them. You know, it's like <laughs> so as research workers, you don't want to cause distress to your animals. And also it's very um, time consuming and energy consuming. But thankfully, there's a lot of ways that you can learn about them uh, just by the signs that they leave behind. So whether it's spot marks or whether it's uh, camera trapping where you know what all animals are in the area or if it's from presence, whether it's from poop collection or um, the uh, scrape marks that they leave behind on trees. Uh, but considering the vast applications that you can use and also Nepal's topography, I would definitely feel that DNA and genetic work is best applicable to Nepal. So there are many ways that you can get DNA from an animal, whether it's uh, skin that comes off when they're in water or whether it's from the eggs of birds or feathers, urine, hair follicle, poop, I'm going to say poop a lot, uh, <laughs> saliva, bones, teeth, um, and even the uh, skeleton and the skin that molds off of um, amphibians and insects. So, and they're found year round, wherever you go, and it's, you don't have to track an animal for months and months to collect them. You know, you go for a field visit, you go in your survey area, and you'll find a lot of this around. So you come to your lab with your sample, you extract your DNA. So what all can you find out? First of all, what species is it? Is it the species of interest that you're looking at? You can do species ID. You can also do sex ID. Is it male or female? And then after you do that, and if you have a number of samples, did they all come from one animal? Or are they from individual animals? This is very simple stuff. We do this at our lab every day. And I think even this um, information about the species, the sex, and the individual will give you enough information about the population of an animal that's in an area. It will give you enough information to make very concrete conservation plans to protect that animal. And a lot of the non-invasive ways that I talked about earlier about camera trap and fog marks, this is, you can get that from this too. But the beauty of genetics is that this is just the beginning. So, what else can you do? So when you uh, individually ID an uh, animal, it's like getting a genetic fingerprint of that animal. So in the future, if you were to ever get a sample of a tiger, let's say, um, and it's any, any, any sort of sample, you analyze it, and you run it through your database. Have we identified this tiger before? And you say, oh, OK, maybe it was 118, uh, tiger number 118 from Chitwan. But if it's a new tiger, you can look at the genetics, you can look at the genetic makeup and say, Okay, we haven't sampled this before, but looking at his DNA, I would say that it comes from so-and-so. Like, you can identify a source population for that animal. And this is a very useful tool when you're discussing about um, monitoring an animal or population census over time. But what it is really applicable for is wildlife forensics. Because you are not always going to get a really nice skin to say, oh, that's a tiger. Sometimes you just get bones and teeth or pieces of hair. Or it's in a mixture, it's in a medicine, and you don't know what was in that medicine. You can extract DNA from virtually anything, and then be able to say, okay, this species is in that. And if you have done enough study, you're able to identify, okay, this tiger was poached in so-and-so area. So if you know where the tigers are being poached, then the law enforcement agencies can work accordingly to not let that happen anymore. 
I love genetics. <coughs> I love genetics. Another beauty of genetics is that um, it goes from genetic diversity that exists within each one of us to the population and on a landscape level. So we're doing tiger work right now, and we have collected lovely vast number of hundreds and hundreds of poop from across the landscape. So what this allows us to do is that when we do some DNA analysis, we can say, oh, so these three poop belong to that particular tiger. And then we say, oh, so then these ones belong to that. So then this gives us a really nice distribution pattern in gene codes. You can see, oh, where are they found? You can see where, if there's territory overlap and how many there are in a population. But what you can also find out is once we get the results from Bardia, how different are the tigers of Bardia from, from Chitwan? Do they share similar genetic characteristics or not? Because if they are um, showing a lot of similarity, then it's good because it shows it's a connection, connected population. And a connected population is a healthy population. But if that connection is not there, and you're finding very, it seems very isolated from each other, then you've got a problem. And we can actually identify when you do analysis, how many generations ago did this uh, separation happen of population? So what was it? Was it a road that got built perhaps? Was it a city? What was it? And then you can then mitigate it accordingly. Because every population of a species has to have genetic diversity so that it's like arsenal. The more diversity you have, the more arsenal you have against any environmental stress that's going to come your way in the future. So if you're not genetically diverse, you're not, being, you're not going to be able to adapt in the future for whatever challenges that may come. So a healthy tiger that's supposed to look like this will not end up looking so pretty in the future. And uh, in terms of genetic diversity, um, what is, is really applicable if you're going to do um, uh, captive breeding. So this is what we're, this, this is what we're doing with uh, white rumped vultures in Jitwan. Endangered species, 95% popula uh, population decline in the last decade. You have 60 of them in a captive breeding program in Tarai. But it's been three, four years and there's not been a single hatchling. Problem with these vultures is that you can't tell which one of them are male and which one of them are female. So we don't know the sex ratio of that breeding center. And we also don't know the genetic diversity. So what we have been proposing to do is to gently identify which ones are vultures, uh, which ones vultures are male and female, so that when you want them to breed, you, you know, breed the opposite pairs together, not male-male, <laughs> together. And you also don't want uh, vultures that are very genetically similar to mate with each other because you want to maintain the diversity that exists so that when you release them in the wild, you have that genetic diversity conserved. Other applications of genetics in terms of conservation is to reduce human-animal uh, conflict. In Tarai, the hills and the mountains, you have tigers, common leopards, and snow leopards eating livestock. And this often creates farmers getting very angry and then killing them in retaliation. But so there's a technique that's been developed so that if the bite, if the kill is fresh, you can go to the bite wounds and get a swab so that you're collecting saliva from the predator. And then you can see what exactly killed it. So then you can identify a problem predator and then work accordingly. Why is it eating livestock? And maybe it's not a common leopard like the farmer thought. Maybe it's just a rowdy dog. So this does help give information to reduce a human-animal conflict. You also have from poop. You can also, not only is a, let's say, a snow leopard pooping out its own cells, everything that it ate is also going to come out in that. So pre-DNA is in there. So with this technique called uh, next generation sequencing, you can actually identify the various prey species and quantify them. And it's pretty cool. So that you know how much uh, of, let's say, blue sheep constitutes of his diet. And so if you want to protect snow leopards, you have to then make sure that, okay, it's, it eats a lot of blue sheep. Therefore, you must be protecting blue sheep in return. And if, it, if you're trying to look at blue sheep, what does blue sheep eat? And if it's a certain type of vegetation, is it there? So it gives you a nice picture of this uh, food chain so that you can give a holistic approach to conservation. Along with all the prey DNA, there's also a lot of viral DNA and uh, bacteria DNA that comes out in that shit, right? So I'm going to have to say shit. I'm sorry. Ooh. So, uh, so then you can say, okay, does the snow leopard suffer from any disease? Does the population suffer from a disease? So then you can act accordingly. What we're doing with uh, elephants in Chitwan is actually not just detecting, but we're trying to make a diagnostic tool through genetics so that you can very efficiently find out if a tiger, uh, sorry, if an uh, elephant there has TB. 
because the captive elephants have been shown to have TP and it comes to humans and back again, which is a problem for livelihood and it's also a problem for the tourism sector. But what we are also concerned about is that how breeding works in the elephants down there in the Talai is that there's a male bull that comes from the wild and mates with these um, captive elephants and goes back. When it goes back, you don't want that male bull taking TB out into the wild Asian uh, elephant population. So we're trying to create a tool so that we can rapidly see which one of the captive elephants have TB and start treatment immediately. So that it does not transfer to humans, not to the wild elephant population. And um, genetics right now in Nepal has been a really wonderful tool for discovery as well. Last year, I went to Dormostan. I had a very simple thesis. It was to identify the moss deer that was in uh, Lomunistan, what do you find? Is it the chrysogaster, is it the leucogaster, is it the fuscus? We didn't know the distribution. So I went to some palace, I came back, looked at this DNA, and it's a completely different species of moss deer. And nobody had found out about it. And I just went for two weeks and voila, I mean, this example I think just shows how much there is to learn about our biodiversity. There's so much left to learn, and how can you conserve what you don't even know exists? So this was, Pretty cool finding. I just stumbled into it. I get to name it pretty soon, so I'm kind of excited. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's um, that's how we've been doing wildlife conservation through innovative technology here. And I'm very proud that it's a completely Nepali-driven thing. We have developed our own local capacity, and we're doing inter international-level research right here in Nepal. And it's something I'm very proud of. Thank you.